We've, uh, we've hammered out some differences through the Lord's grace. Another day, and we'll talk about those. But uh, she is definitely my rock and my covenant partner, whom I'm enjoying doing life with, with the Lord. It's just wonderful. Um, she has a heart of gold. She just, she has a heart of love. And she gets that from her mother. Now her mother's an awesome lady of woman of God too. So this is my lovely bride, Carlene. I just want to release her today through the power of the Holy Spirit to pour into your life and to just sow something into you that's going to catapult you to the next level of glory in your heart. So Carlene Luca, everybody today, bless you. And here she is. Thank you. Uh, before I get started, I want to share something with you that the Lord showed me during worship. And it was during this song that uh, we were singing, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. And I saw the Lord behind like a podium and there was a huge crowd that he was teaching. And I saw him bend forward and like he was going, what? Like this? And then he said, come here. So somewhere way out in the crowd was a young child that was asking a question. And the Lord said, come on up here. And the Lord got down on one knee, eye to eye with that child, and answered their question. And he said, that's what I'm going to do for these ladies today. I'm going to call them out of a crowd. I hear their questions, and I have the answer. So that was for you. Today I'm going to talk on identity and our kingdom identity. But I want to start out by asking you a question. Who are you? Some of you would say, well, I'm, I'm Carlene. I'm Jessica. I'm Faye. Or you might say, I'm Randy's wife, or I'm Thomas and Anna's mom, or Israel's grandma. Then some people might even introduce themselves using their title or their position. They might say, you know, I'm Lily, I'm president of Town Bank. Or I'm Linda, I'm the children's pastor at such and such church. And you would be correct in stating those things. But those things are not who you are. They're not your true identity. Nor is your identity based on what others have said about you, by your painful past experiences, or your comparison of yourself to others. That's a big one. Perhaps you identify yourself as <clears throat> the high school dropout, the ex-wife of so-and-so, the daughter of the town drunk, the addict, or the former addict. And despite those being truths, that is not who you are or whose you are. The enemy of our soul always reminds us of what we are not. We're not smart enough. We're not good enough. We're not holy enough. And the list goes on. And when we succumb to his shame and blame, it becomes easy to focus on the things and adopt them as our identity. And then the lies that we believe about ourselves limit us from fulfilling God's calling on our life. I can honestly say in the past, I've, I've placed my identity in a number of those things. And occasionally, I still catch myself doing that. But have you ever stopped and wondered what God thinks about you? Have you ever asked him, Lord, what is it that you say about me? Well, we tend to look at ourselves through the lens of our failures and our painful, broken, mixed up pasts. Remember that he knows exactly who we are. I've noticed when I get in a struggle with who I am or whose I am, I'll hear Holy Spirit say, um, excuse me, princess. And I'll be like, 
straighten that little tiara, put my shoulders back and walk across that stage. Because Galatians 3.26 says that we are all children of God through faith. And he's the king of kings. And if I'm his daughter, by golly, I'm a princess. I need to act like it. I need to walk in that. Sometimes there are times when I feel defeated or overwhelmed. And then I'll hear Holy Spirit say, Now, victorious daughter, like, what are you going to do with this? And I'm like, hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm bad. You want a piece of this? How about you? Come on. Yeah, me and my God got this. Psalms 26, or 20, verse 6 says, Now I know this, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. And Deuteronomy 20, verse 4 says, For the Lord, the God, fights for me against my enemies to give me the victory. And Corinthians says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How about that? Now you want a piece of me? I already got the victory. God knew that throughout our lives we'd be told lies about who we are and who we are not. Our Creator's words show us who we were created to be and who we have always been. And who He says you are is likely going to be very different than how you view yourself or what others have said about you. In a world that's constantly bombarding us with messages about who we should be and what defines us, finding our true identity can feel like an uphill battle. I don't know about you, but every day it's a struggle. There's something that comes up, and I either feel like, oh, again? Really? Or I think, wow, that looks really bad. Or, I know I shouldn't have said that. But you know what? All it is is one little conversation with the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. Pick me up, brush me off, and let's go on our way. So let's uncover some empowering truths that reaffirm our identity in the eyes of the Lord because the Bible offers invaluable wisdom in this um, area. So if you feel like you're struck, stuck in your old names, your old mentalities, and the opinions of people who knew you by your past, you are more than you've been told. The truth, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone, a new life has begun. Or Isaiah tells us, you will be called by a new name by the mouth of the Lord. And Isaiah also says, do not cling to the events of the past or dwell on what happened long ago. Forget about all of that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. You are not identified by your past. Brand new, that's your new name. Or how about the one who feels like you've never been set free from the shame of who you were, what you've done, or how you used to live? You are so much more than you've been told. The truth? If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. My brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You are not chained to shame. Free indeed, that's your new name. How about the one who feels unworthy or less than? You are more than you've been told. The truth? We are God's masterpiece. And a different version says, we are the product of his hand, heaven's poetry etched on our lives, 
created in the anointed Jesus to accomplish the good works God arranged long ago. Genesis says, you're made in the image of God. And Isaiah says, since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, I will give people and nations in exchange for you. You are not unworthy. God's masterpiece. That's your new name. For the one who feels unloved or too broken, like the things from your past could never be redeemed, you are more than you've been told. The truth? While we were wasting our lives in sin, God revealed his powerful love to us in a tangible display. His son died for us. Greater love have, has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends, which is exactly what Jesus did for us. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you unto myself. You are not unlovable. Greatly loved, that's your new name. How about the one who feels like an afterthought, or a mistake, or a second place? You are more than you've been told. The truth? To you who belong to God and the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we know, dear brothers and sisters, God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. There's no requirement to be chosen by God other than to belong to him. And it is clear to us, friends, that God not only loves you very much, but has also put his hand on you for something special. This means that not only is your position important, but God has intentionally placed you where you are. Zephaniah says he takes great delight in you and rejoices over you with singing. You are not an afterthought. Chosen. That's your new name. How about the one who feels abandoned or alone? You're more than you've been told. The truth? John says, I don't call you servants any longer. I call you friends. And Psalm says, he is a friend who listens. It also says, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So you are not abandoned or alone. Friend of God, that's your new name. Now let's look at a couple examples of people in the Bible that saw themselves one way only for God to bestow on them a new name. How about the lady with the issue of blood? Scripture tells us that she suffered with a physically painful affliction for 12 years. And that meant she was labeled unclean and ostracized by society. But with one word, Jesus changed her identity. He called her daughter. He didn't call her unclean. He didn't say, go away from me. He called her daughter. When she allowed her faith to rise up and not only stop, not allow anything to stop her from touching him, it only took an instant for her to become who she was created to be. Now let me ask you this. What's your faith level right now? Is it high enough that nothing will stop you from touching him? that nothing can cause you to believe you are something he has not called you to be? In one instant, one instant, one word, you can be who he created you to be. Let's look at Esther. Esther was orphaned as a child, adopted into a family she likely did not know well, 
forced into a foreign land and had to adopt to a foreign culture. She was part of a minority race that was held in such low esteem that her identity was kept a secret for a long time. Esther wasn't even her real name. Then, as a teenager, she was forced into the king's pool of concubines. So basically, she was to become a sex slave. And by some very slim chance, from that pool of ladies, she might be chosen to be queen. While some people who've grown up under painful circumstances tend to question God's goodness and grow dist distrustful of him, Esther never lost trust in him. Although she had no control over what was happening to her, she took control of her responses. She did so with humility and grace. She trusted the Lord explicitly, not focusing on who society said she was, but who he called her to be. And in doing so, Esther became queen and saved her entire people from being eradicated. She went from being an orphan to being placed in the highest position for a woman in that day. God penned Esther's story to show us how he works sovereignly in the lives of ordinary people in unordinary circumstances who society has rejected, who the society has given a different name to. He works sovereignly in those lives to, some, to bring out circumstances that he has set for us, names that he has for us. Let's look at Hagar. Hagar was an unmarried, pregnant, abused, runaway slave. She was forced to become a surrogate mother. She was abused and mistreated so severely that she ran away to die. Her life had been irreversibly altered, and her future looked quite bleak. Any of us been in that situation? Things beyond your control, wanted to run away. But while she was fleeing, the Lord met her in the wilderness. And no doubt it surprised her that anyone, especially the Lord, would notice her. And yet he called her Hagar. He said, Hagar, where, are you, where have you come from and where are you going? Notice he didn't say, Hey, woman, hey, you over there in the desert, hey, slave girl. No, he called her by her name. All of heaven knows each of us by our name. And I don't mean Kelly or Lucy or Carlene. I mean the name that we are known by in heaven. Free. Indeed, masterpiece, loved, that's how heaven knows us. We are not identified by our circumstances, our situations, or the locations. We are daughters of the Most High King, royalty, princesses, held in high esteem. That's your new name. So I've talked a lot about who you are and whose you are and that you've been given a new identity and a new name. But how do you get there? It's nice to hear this. It's nice to think, oh yeah, that works for her. I hope she's getting this. But how do we apply it for ourselves? So I've got some suggestions for you. Immerse yourself in scripture. Look up the scriptures that pertain to your situation or what you're dealing with or who you feel you are. If you're feeling unworthy, meditate on the scriptures that tell you how worthy you are, how precious you are, how much he loves you. Meditate on those. That doesn't mean just read them. 
That means study them, think about them, ponder them. Keep them at the forefront of your mind. If you're dealing with shame due to your past, meditate on the freedom scriptures. Look up the women of the Bible, like a few of them I've just mentioned. Study them. Learn how they walked out, who they truly were in the kingdom of heaven, how God walked them through what others said about them or the circumstances they had no control over. He always has a way out. We just have to find it and follow it. Another suggestion, decree out loud who you are. Regardless of how you feel, regardless of what's going on, you just simply say, I'm a daughter of the king. Galatians tells me I'm a daughter of the king. I'm beautiful. I'm intelligent. I have the mind of Christ. I am blessed and highly favored. Call forth the truth and speak it out loud. Don't just think it in your mind. Speak it out loud. There's power in your spoken words. You affect the atmosphere. Not only that, it affects your soul, and our souls are mind, will, and emotions. Our body and our mind respond to our own voices. And what we say or what we call ourselves is what our mind thinks we are. That's how our body reacts. That's how our actions are formed, by who we think we are. So speak it out loud. I'm a daughter of the king. I am mighty and powerful. You want a piece of me? Come on. That's who you are. Play some worship music. Not only does it help to usher you into the presence, but it's been scientifically proven to improve our health. Physical, mental, emotional. And that is secular. The secular world has proven that. That's not just the church proving it. <clears throat> it helps reduce your heart rate, your blood pressure, feelings of anxiety and stress, and it promotes hope and comfort. And most importantly, spend time in his presence. Find a place where you can go and shut the door. Shut out the world. Leave your electronic devices in the other room. Dim the lights if you need to. But get on your face before him. And don't come with a grocery list. God, I need this. I need this. I need this. Well, they said this. I want that. No. You come before him with honor and adoration and thanksgiving. You tell him how great and mighty he is. Thank him for all the things that he's done for you, all the things that you know he's going to do. Lay on your face before him. Just wait for him because he will talk to you. He will answer you. He will lift you up out of the pit that you're in. Just take hold of his hand. But you can't do that with the TV on, looking at Facebook, trying to feed your family, get the dishes and the laundry done, and think you're praying all the time that you're doing these things. You can do that, but that's not entering into his presence. So the good news is, your identity is who God says you are. Bill Johnson had a quote that I heard many years ago, and it stuck with me. And sometimes it's really hard to put this into practice. But he said, you are not allowed to have a thought about yourself that God doesn't have about you. God has never thought that I was a failure. He's never thought that I was not good enough. I was not smart enough. I wasn't holy enough. He saw me and still sees me who he created me to be. And he knows all I can be. And that's what he expects of me. So that's a good perspective I have to try to keep the forefront of my mind when I'm having one of those days where I hear, um, excuse me, princess? Or, <clears throat> oh, victorious daughter, 
then I have to think, that's what he calls me. Those are the thoughts he has towards me. I got to get rid of this stinking thinking today. And sometimes it takes a break in your routine to go into your quiet place and enter into his presence so you can hear what he's saying to you for that day or that moment. Remember, no one nor any situation has the power to define you. Only your creator can define you. He created you in his image and you have his mind. You are more than you've been told. So I ask you again, who are you? I bet your answer's different. I hope it's different. If you struggle with any of these areas that I mentioned today, I would love to pray with you at the end of the session. I'll meet you at the pool, and I would love to see the Lord pour out on you today and change the perspective you have of yourself into the image he has for you. Thank you. I, I just told her, I said, I want that quote. I didn't have a chance to write it all down before she went to her next point that Bill Johnson made because identity is my heart. I love for people to know who they are in Christ. I don't care if you're seven years old or if you're 97 years old. If you don't know who you are in Christ, then you need to see one of us ladies at the end of session four because we're here to help you and to point you in the right direction because that's where our power comes from, is from knowing who we are and whose we are. Awesome job, Carlene. You got something else? Okay, awesome. I was going to ask, see about that. So she does the scriptures on identity. She has some copies printed up and they'll be available out front. Um, it looks like they're already out there ready. So um, we are way ahead of schedule. So I'm going to give some extra time for lunch today. So we're going to come back here at...